today I'm going to teach you a little bit about um, offshoring, a couple of different models. I'm going to talk about some tools. I'm also going to talk about some case studies for real southeast Queensland businesses, what they're doing and the sort of value that they're getting out of offshoring. Um, and then also a bit about our personal story and some tools where you can get some even more value than you have for the next 15 minutes. So let's get into it. A bit about me, I love a bit of self-promotion and talking about, uh, talking about uh, media and, and I did actually Google myself yesterday, I, I admit that. Um, so, featured in the Career Mail last month, um, which is a great coup for us talking about how we're helping um, SMEs in Queensland. I've been featured um, across the Philippines in media, radio and news, been um, interviewed by Microsoft, a um, couple of speaking events this year already booked up on marketing and outsourcing, and um, also a previous board member of the Entrepreneurs' Organisation Brisbane Chapter, certified practising marketer and um, generally just love helping businesses and, you know, that's about me. So let's get into some tools. So I'm here to talk about kind of outsourcing and offshoring, but really I call it the global resourcing phenomenon. And that's because global resourcing and getting accent, access to amazing talent all over the world is completely changing the business environment. And this is pretty cool. This is a very, very cool tool. Hands up anyone who's used Fiverr. Great. So why the name Fiverr? A whole lot of stuff for five bucks. Five US dollars, so we're talking what? Seven bucks, soon to be eight, soon to be nine, <laughs> soon to be 10 Australian dollars. Um, but seriously, there are some things that you can do and can't do on Fiverr, but these are people all over the world sitting at their desk waiting to do stuff for you for five bucks, and I've got an example in a second. You can get animations, you can get whiteboard videos, you can get, um, you can get people doing voiceovers. I'll give you an example. I used to pay $300 for a 30-second voiceover from an Australian voiceover talent to do radio ads in my marketing agency. We then discovered Fiverr. We now have to buy a couple of $5 gigs, but we pay about 60 bucks for a professional voiceover talent because we can access a tool like this. So I want to give you an example. This is something that I did for the Entrepreneurs' Organisation. Um, we use this as top and tails on kind of video and animation and online stuff. Five bucks, took me about five minutes to sign up, put my credit card details in advance. Big warning, you have to pay up front, <laughs> but it's only five bucks. So if the work comes back and it's terrible, it's only five bucks. <laughs> So nice little kind of top and tail that you can put in your, in your video, in your online marketing. And all I had to supply was the logo and they did the animation, they put the background music behind it. What a winner. So this, this is kind of one example of a tool that has grown out of you know, the world being flash and us as business owners being able to access resources all over the world. Oh, and by the way, Fiverr is a massive time waster because there's all sorts of fun stuff on there. Like if you want someone for five bucks to dance around with like a horse mask on and a sign that says, happy birthday, you know, happy 40th for, for your mate, you can actually do that. And your logo, yep. So just be aware if you're on Fiverr, it, you know, you'll probably be on there for a little while. Um, all right, so Odesk and Freelancer. Who's used Odesk and Freelancer before? Cool, so this, these are basically people again all over the world that are of varying levels of experience that you can access anywhere from you know, three bucks upwards. Um, it's great for short-term project work, it's great for stuff if you don't care if your IP is leaked, it's great for you know, data mining, simple stuff, short-term, awesome. Um, all online, you know, it's varying levels of, of quality, but you know, great value for money for those kind of short-term low-risk projects. 99 Designs. Anyone use 99 Designs before? Cool. So this has come out of a, a part of offshoring and outsourcing, which is crowdsourcing. And I'll tell you very quickly how this works. You 
put up a brief for a new logo design. It might be for a startup company, it might be for a quarterly promotion you've got, it might be for a Christmas card, it might, whatever it is, it's a little logo design that you want done. You put it up there and people all over the world submit their designs. And you get to have a look at them over the course of five days. And if you like one of them, you'll pay 99 bucks for it. But you will have hundreds of, of designers all over the world responding to your brief for 99 bucks. I've used it before. Again, it's great for you know, short-term projects, for, for stuff that's you know, internal fun stuff. And yeah, a really, really cool tool. And it's crowdsourcing because the whole crowd are contributing to the development of, of that piece of work. Again, slides will be available you know, for all this sort of stuff. So yes, check it out. Now, I wanted to move on to a model that's a little bit more closer to home for me because I've, I've utilised a whole lot of models um, when it comes to working with people overseas. And I wanted to share with you a couple of insights about the Philippines. Because people might wonder, why, why is everyone talking about the Philippines at the moment? Why are staff in the Philippines? Why is it so popular? So a couple of different facts is other than Singapore, it's the only other place in Asia where English is the primary language. So kids actually go through school learning English. So that's the number one. That's why it's becoming the, the voice capital of outsourcing is because the English skills are amazing. The accent is more palatable than most other places. There are half a million university graduates a year of high quality. So the access to talent is a big talent pool. The other thing is it's the second largest industry in the Philippines, so the government is supporting it. It's got a lot of structure around supporting companies like BIPO, who are foreign owned in the Philippines, structure for education, infrastructure, IT, technology, all those sorts of things. It's not just call centre staff. So when you think about the Philippines, you think about, good morning, sir, how can I help you? <laughs> You know, it's the banks, the telcos, the insurance companies, and that's just kind of scratching the surface. That's where enterprise level and corporates have been, and they've been there for 15 years. And what's happening at the moment in a small business market is that businesses are recognising that there's something in that. There's talent there, there's people that are motivated, and it's not just call centre staff. I'll share those case studies with you in a moment. The other thing is the cost of living. Don't confuse cost of living with quality. The cost of living in the Philippines is very low. They're a developing country, so staff wages for administrative people start at around $400 a month for the wage component. People are smart, motivated, and proactive. I'll tell you something that does not happen in the Philippines. You do not get feedback from your staff that they don't want to do that task. Oh, I'm sorry, that's, that's not in my job description. That's, I'm, I'm above that. I won't, you know, <laughs> that doesn't happen in the Philippines. Motivated, keen, happy to learn, on the most part. So a couple of acronyms to share with you and one of the insights for some, some things that I've seen in the Philippines. BPO and BKO. BPO, Business Process Outsourcing. That's a popular acronym. There is a bit of a link to us, of course, BPO. So you probably understand the connection in our name. BKO is business knowledge outsourcing. So one of the things that I saw when I've toured and been to different organisations in the Philippines when I, was, when I was doing business research is a company that had radiologists and they were working for a US medical centre that was situated in a hospital. And what they were doing is the Filipino radiologist had the x-rays coming down via link to to themselves and they were in a, in a dark room and they were actually reading the x-rays and they were giving feedback and they were giving a preliminary advice on that particular information that they were getting, the break or the, you know, they were specialists in all different areas for all the different radi radiology um, aspects and they had a service level of about five minutes. So they would look at that, they'd give their feedback, they'd type it up, it would shoot back to America via a link and then the senior radiologist would check it and it would be out back on the medical floor within about 10 minutes. So these are the sorts of things that I've seen in the Philippines. It's, again, it's not just call centre. If it can be done in front of a computer, there is the potential 
that you can do it in the Philippines. So some statistics. Ibis World Analyst has quoted and shared with us that about 25% of the outsourcing market is now in the SME space. I don't know whether you guys are talking to people who are now thinking about it, who are doing it, but about six years ago was the first time I've heard of someone start a small business operator starting to, to do business in the Philippines. Now in the circles I kind of work in, particularly in the entrepreneurs organisation, about 50% of the entrepreneurs in the Brisbane chapter have staff in the Philippines. So it's changing and it's growing at an extremely rapid rate. These are some of the organisations that we work with. I'm going to share some case study information. So some examples of what's being done in the Philippines. So software as a service, looking at customer service and sales support, so staff that are working directly with customers, the developers, the design and marketing. This company has their whole front end of their business in the Philippines. They're a startup and they specifically designed those front end processes to fit with their Philippines team. Travel and Tourism, this is a large Queensland company. They've got reservations, so they're taking calls from all around the world. This is amazing. They've actually got fleet calls, so breakdown calls from their camper vans. They've got a customer in the middle of the Northern Territory. The level one support for the breakdowns is a call that comes into the office in the Philippines. Pretty incredible stuff. They also do SEO, content writing, accounts payable and accounts receivable. Manufacturing. This company's in Coffs Harbour. They've been working in the Philippines for about 12 months. They started there basically to get some um, work done on their internal CRM and a bit of sales support and marketing support. They then had their purchasing office resign and they thought, gee, I wonder if we can send purchasing offshore. And they did that. Then they said, you know what, our CAD drawers, some of the stuff is simple and some of it is complex. How about we take the simple stuff and take that offshore? So we said, sure, let's get some CAD drawers in and see if they can, you know, see if that quality is what you need. So they now have CAD drawers. Um, they basically went through each of their functional areas of their business and found what are the lower value tasks that can be take, taken offshore so that the staff in Australia can work on the more high value revenue producing work. They had no shrinkage within their business in terms of employment and their revenue has absolutely exceeded their expectations. Now they took things to the next level. This is their business in the Philippines. They're manufacturing, they went from being a client of ours to incubating and actually growing their own foreign owned entity in the Philippines. And so they have a, a manufacturing space where they're now actually producing their products and can now compete on a global level Whereas about two years ago when I met this company, the owners said, you know what, kind of lost our mojo. We don't know whether we're going to be in this game anymore. It's getting really globally competitive. So this is a fantastic case study, I think, because they've just gone ahead in leaps and bounds. Here's a picture of uh, a particular client who's got their, you know, they've ossified their space. They're really, um, you know, making sure that their, their staff understand a lot about the Australian and New Zealand. You can see the, the two photos up there of, of that geography to be able to help customers. So when they say, oh, I'm calling from here, they don't go, oh, great, just uh, drive down the road to you know the nearest servo. It's like, well, they understand that it's 300 kilometres away. So they're not going to give bad advice when they're over the phone. Um, a telecommunications client, they've got HR assistance, they've got auditing accounts, receivable accounts payable, lead generation, so business to business appointment setting. They've got graphic design, data entry, project managers for their phone system installation part of their business and uh, quality assurance processing for provisioning. The next case study is a professional services firm. One of their challenges as, as an accounting firm is that they found the bookkeeping work that was being done to be of a low standard. It was one of their pain points. They were wanting to deal with the client on the accounting side and give strategic advice, but the data that was coming through from random bookkeepers was sometimes a problem. So what they decided to do after going to the Philippines is create a bookkeeping business called Evolve. So they actually created a whole secondary business to, to help solve that, that pain 
pain problem that they had in their accountancy firm, they wouldn't have done it in Australia because it wouldn't have made sense. There was, there was not enough margin in it. But in the Philippines, when they can have access to the staff wages, it's fairly repeatable data entry work, they're actually able to, to fill that gap and help provide a new product to their client set and solve that pain problem in their accountancy firm at the same time. Um, marketing agency and telecommunications, graphic designers, social media administration support, software businesses move their whole software team from Indonesia to the Philippines and manufacturing. These guys are really interesting. What they do in the Philippines is they data mine for construction work that's coming up long term. So they're looking at projects that are 12 months away. And what their staff in the Philippines do is look for those leads and look for those contact, contacts and gather intelligence to give that to their product managers to then chase in the future. So, some tips for those of you who want to launch into the outsourcing and offshoring space. These are the five common paths to outsourcing failure that we see. The superhero, this is when you think that your staff in the Philippines can do everything. The graphic designer is going to suddenly pick up administration and data mining and over the phone. Just think about what you would hire someone in Australia and the skills and stick to that. They're not superheroes. The next is, it's true because it's in my resume. You have to skills test. You have to skills test. It's a really, really simple thing that we miss. We miss it in Australia and for most people, unless they're given the guidance and the structure, they'll miss it when they hire staff overseas as well. Yes doesn't equal yes. The passive yes usually means, could mean yes, could mean no, could mean I'm not sure, could mean I'm not really comfortable telling you that I'm not sure. So in managing staff and in managing Filipino staff, we often have someone who is an expert in helping with training and development to solve this problem. The next one is no feedback. So just because they're remote doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest in feedback. And the quicker you give feedback, the better result you'll have. And number five is if you are a busy entrepreneur and you've got lots of stuff going on, offshore staff is not going to solve your problem. If you do not have the time to train and develop your offshore staff, you will get no value. So that's, these are the common things that we see go wrong when people start to offshore. Very quickly, my story, I first went to the Philippines because my marketing agency was getting crunched on margins. Absolutely crunched. Customers wanted more. They wanted quicker, quicker turnaround time. My wage costs were going up. So I went to the Philippines to see if I could solve it. I went gung-ho and I hired bookkeeping staff and designers and administration. And through that experience of working with different firms, basically decided to start Beepo because I went through a lot of tough times trying to get that right and I didn't get a lot of help from the providers that I worked with. So my husband and I created Beepo. We opened our doors in April 2014. We've now got 209 staff. We work with about 40 small and medium-sized businesses, mostly in southeast Queensland, to be honest. Here's our newest facility in Clark. We've got space for 700, and we expect to fill that within a 12-month period. This is my management team. I have a full management team in the Philippines that manage everything from HR, recruitment, IT. Um, the, the breadth of experience and the depth of experience is really, we've tested it, and I can tell you from my own experience that you can hire people not just for simple task orientated, but if you want strategic thinkers, then you can also get that in the Philippines. Picture of some of our facilities. Now, I'm a marketer by trade. I want to tell you the first thing that I did when I, when I walked in and I saw the name tags here, is I took a photo of all of the name tags. And probably tomorrow morning, by about 9 o'clock, you'll have an invitation from me. And I didn't do it, but my team in the Philippines that manages my social media will connect all of us, so you can choose to connect to me or not, doesn't really matter, I hope so. So I've compiled a whole heap of tips. Whether you do them here in Australia with your staff or do them offshore, it doesn't matter. But it's called the 107 ideas for outsourcing your sales and marketing. And it's stuff like I just shared with you today. How to connect and how to really, you know, drive your business forward with using those resources. So the information for the download will be in the slides and um, I hope you get some value from that and some value from this evening. Thank you.